Many times throughout this course, going all the way back to the introductory set of videos, we've talked about the importance of understanding the deep structure of organic chemistry in really becoming a master of the subject. I would argue that nowhere is this more true than in the province of reaction mechanisms, where someone who's truly an expert can make this look like absolute magic to someone who's a novice with less familiarity with patterns and the underlying structure of organic mechanisms. And although some of that expertise is based on intuition that the expert has developed over years and years and years of studying and applying organic chemistry with, that we can't hope to reach in a single semester course, I do still want you to appreciate the underlying framework of organic chemistry because mechanistic reasoning really comes down to understanding how molecules work. And so it's not just about drawing the steps of a particular organic reaction. It's about understanding how each of these steps is really part of a bigger, more general picture about how molecules react. And to be honest, not just organic molecules. A lot of this has relevance to the inorganic world as well. Although we're really going to dig into this in the context of reaction mechanisms in the next lesson, I want to begin with a video in this lesson on the classes of organic reactions, as this is one of the first things you should do when encountering an organic reaction. You should figure out what class it fits into. And this isn't quite mechanistic really in nature. This isn't really a mechanistic question as it just has to do with the structural changes that occur in the conversion of the reactants to the products. There are really only five classes of organic chemical reactions. There are only five ways in which an organic molecule can change. And these five categories encompass all organic reactions based on their logical structure. The first four are mutually exclusive. Every reaction fits into one of those four categories, and the fifth can also be assigned to one of the first four categories, as we'll see. Substitution reactions involve the exchange of one group for another. Addition reactions involve the incorporation of the atoms of one molecule that we call the reagent into another, which we call the substrate. Elimination reactions are the opposite of addition, and they involve the expulsion of a small molecule with formation of a pi bond, a double or triple bond, in the substrate. And finally, rearrangement reactions don't involve the exchange of any groups or addition or elimination of a molecule, but just involve a reorganization of the bonds and atoms within a molecule, possibly with the intervention of a catalyst. Finally, oxidation-reduction reactions can also occur in an organic context, and these reactions involve the exchange of CH for CX bonds, or vice versa. But notably, in a mechanistic sense, oxidation-reduction reactions in organic chemistry can be classified into one of the previous four categories. Let's take a detailed look at substitution first. Substitution involves the exchange of one group for another. So for example, in a general substrate Rx, when Rx reacts with Y, and the group X is replaced with Y, that's a substitution reaction. We can classify substitutions and additions as well, as we'll see, into electrophilic and nucleophilic types. This terminology can get a bit confusing because it's not clear what the word electrophilic or nucleophilic is referring to. Whenever you see the word electrophilic or nucleophilic preceding a reaction type, realize that it refers to the reagent, so that electrophilic substitution involves the use of an electron poor or electron deficient reagent that is itself an electrophile or serves as a precursor to a more reactive electrophilic intermediate. That means that the organic substrate in these reactions acts as a nucleophile. An example of electrophilic substitution is shown here. What's really happening in this reaction, which we'll see when we study aromatic substitution reactions later, is that the reagents are generating a highly reactive electrophilic intermediate, the NO2 plus cation. This reacts with the substrate, here benzene, to give nitrobenzene. And the byproduct of this process, the group that is substituted for, the group that comes off, is H+. We've exchanged one electrophile, H+, for another, NO2+. That's what makes this electrophilic substitution. Nucleophilic substitution, which we'll put a bigger focus on first, involves the use of an electron-rich or nucleophilic reagent, or a reagent that serves as a precursor to a more reactive nucleophile. The organic substrate then acts as an electrophile here. An example of nucleophilic substitution is shown here. And here again, the reagent kind of obscures its actual nature. NaOCH3 is really Na+, which is an innocuous cation, and OCH3- which is the active nucleophile here. The byproduct 
And so the real reason this is called nucleophilic substitution is that we're exchanging one nucleophile, Br-, for another, OCH3-. Addition reactions involve the incorporation of the atoms of one molecule into another. In the organic substrate, a pi bond is always involved so that the x and y atoms in this general picture remain bound to each other after the addition. One of the pairs of electrons in one of the new bonds to either A or B comes from the organic substrate. For example, in this general picture, we see that the bond to B, the bond between B and Y, came from the XY double or triple bond. That's why it's colored black. While the other bond in the product, here between X and A, comes from the reagent, from AB. A and B may not be covalently linked like this. In fact, this is extremely common. We might actually be dealing with a reagent that's more like A minus and B plus, an ionic compound. But nonetheless, this is still referred to as addition, since the elements of A and B, the atoms that make up A and B, are incorporated into the final product. Electrophilic addition involves the use of an electron-poor reagent that is an electrophile itself or is a precursor to an electrophile. The organic substrate thus acts as a nucleophile. And here's an example of electrophilic addition. We can really think of the reagent HCl as H plus and Cl minus. And the thing that's really driving the reactivity here is the proton, H plus. HCl is a highly electrophilic, or a Bronsted acidic is another equivalent way of putting that, molecule. And here the substrate acts as a nucleophile, donating a pair of electrons to H plus to form the key CH bond. Notice here again the somewhat subtle but very important point that the electrons in the CH bond came from the alkene, not from the reagent. Naturally then, nucleophilic substitution involves the use of an electron-rich reagent, which is a nucleophile itself or might serve as a precursor to a nucleophile. The organic substrate here acts as an electrophile, an electron acceptor. Here's an example of nucleophilic addition in the classic context of carbonyl chemistry. The reagent in the first step isn't really LiCH3. It's really Li+, an innocuous cation, and CH3-, the active nucleophile. Notice that the electrons in the new bond between the reagent and the substrate came from the reagent. That's one reason that this is called nucleophilic addition. Notice also that the other atom incorporated into the product, the hydrogen added to oxygen, is not in the reagent in the first step at all. This makes the point that in the general picture, the two groups that are added, A- and B+, might not even be associated with the same reagent. Here, a strongly basic, strongly nucleophilic reagent is added first, and then an acid is added second to add H plus to the substrate. Elimination reactions are the exact reverse of addition. All that I did to generate this picture was simply exchange the reactants and products from the previous slide. This is an important point to keep in mind, because additions and eliminations are not just opposites. They can be actual mechanistic reverses of one another. And so in terms of favorability, if an addition process is favorable, the corresponding elimination, which is the reverse of the addition, must be unfavorable thermodynamically, right? Since all the elimination is, is swapping the reactants and products of the addition. Here's an example of an elimination reaction. And this is a common situation where the byproducts of the reaction aren't shown. Naively, we might think that since elimination is the reverse of addition, that the byproduct here should be the reagent of the addition, which was HCl. But that doesn't make sense given we're under reaction conditions where the strongly basic OT-butyl anion is present. What then are the byproducts of this reaction? Well, notice, as in the addition case, that the electrons that make up the new pi bond in the product had to come from either A or B. In this general picture, they came from the YB bond. And in our example reaction, they came from the CH bond. That means that electron flow like this had to happen, which meant that this hydrogen, which breaks off from the substrate, had to accept a pair of electrons. And the most likely source to take that proton away is the tert-butyl anion. So that's one of our byproducts right there, tert-butyl alcohol. The proton, which we would hypothetically find in HCl, is incorporated into this byproduct. Something had to happen to the chlorine as well 
and for it to depart while leaving an octet of electrons at this carbon, it must have taken the electrons in the carbon-chlorine bond with it as it left. Thus, the other byproduct here is Cl-. And finally, the one thing that's missing to ensure overall charge balance on the product side is the Na plus cation, which is an innocuous spectator throughout this entire process. And so interestingly here, although H plus and Cl minus aren't exactly generated directly, we can find them incorporated into the byproducts of the reaction. We'll return to this point later, but it's often helpful to draw the byproducts of an organic reaction even if they're not given. They'll give you mechanistic insight and help you better understand how the reaction works. Rearrangements can have a wide variety of mechanisms, but really what a rearrangement is is just the reorganization of atoms within a molecule. And re rearrangements may take place in a single elementary step, as in this example here called the COPE rearrangement, or over multiple elementary steps, as in the rearrangement shown here called the Pinacol rearrangement. Distinguishing between these possibilities of one elementary step versus multiple is often a matter of doing mechanistic experiments or relying on analogous reactions or intuition. One important point about rearrangements that distinguishes them from the three other reaction types we've looked at so far is that because they simply involve a skeletal reorganization without the incorporation of any new atoms into the substrate, or the ejection of any atoms from the substrate, these reactions have no byproducts. This doesn't mean that they always lack any other reagents, but any reagents that are used must be used catalytically, meaning in substoichiometric amounts, less than one equivalent, such that they're regenerated at the end of the mechanism. That's what happens in the Pinacol rearrangement. Another way to write this would be with H2SO4 on the reactant side and H2SO4 on the product side since it's consumed at a point in the mechanism but regenerated at a later point. You're probably familiar with redox reactions from your introductory chemistry course. Oxidation is associated with the loss of electrons from an atom or group, while reduction is associated with the gain of electrons by an atom or group. The same is true in an organic context, but because we're dealing only with covalent molecules, really carbon bound covalently to other atoms, we change our focus a little bit. Oxidation and reduction in an organic context always involve the exchange of a CH bond for a CX bond, or vice versa. As this happens at carbon, there is a simultaneous reduction or oxidation in a reagent that occurs as well. And this is because oxidation and reduction always occur together. This should be familiar from your introductory chemistry course, and it's still true now. When we say X here, we're really referring to an electronegative heteroatom, nitrogen, oxygen, halogen, etc. Because X, by definition, is more electronegative than hydrogen, replacement of H by X amounts to a loss of electrons from carbon. We're going from almost electrically neutral in the CH group to a CX group where the carbon likely has a partial positive charge. That's loss of electrons. This is why this represents an oxidation. For the same reason, going the opposite direction from a CX group where carbon is partially positive to a CH group where carbon is more or less electrically neutral, that represents a gain of electrons by the carbon atom. And this is what we refer to as reduction. As a famous example of this, the conversion of glucose, the molecule shown here, to six molecules of CO2 and six molecules of H2O upon reaction with oxygen, one of the reactions that essentially powers life, is an oxidation reaction at each of the carbons of glucose. Notice that all of these carbons in the starting material bear at least one bond to hydrogen. But in the products, all of the carbons have no bonds to hydrogen. All of those have been replaced with new bonds to oxygen, which is more electronegative than carbon. This means that the carbon atoms in glucose have been oxidized by this process. And where is the simultaneous reduction occurring? Well, notice what's happening in oxygen. The oxygen atoms are going from bonds with each other in O2 to bonds to hydrogen atoms in H2O. We've replaced oxygen with hydrogen. This is a reduction. It's not at carbon, but at oxygen, and the same idea applies. And so the oxygen atoms are undergoing reduction as the carbons are undergoing oxidation.
One final point I'll make about organic redox reactions is that they can be categorized mechanistically into one of the previous four categories. Substitution here seems natural, right? Any substitution that replaces H with a more electronegative group X is going to be an oxidation. But other reaction types can also lead to oxidation or reduction. For example, addition is often associated with reduction when the added atom is a hydrogen. Elimination is often associated with oxidation when a hydrogen is eliminated. We won't have much to say about those reaction types here, but you'll see them prominently in your second semester of organic chemistry.